house on fire No one could save me but you It's strange what this I make foolish people do I never dreamed that I meet somebody like This is John Cohen. Welcome to Bedtime Stories. In this episode of Bedtime Stories, we're going to be reading two articles. The first from the BBC, and then the second from the Independent. First article from the BBC was written in October of 2004. The second article, which was sent to me by one of our long-term viewers, uh, Sheena Living Water, sent me this. And this is from July 2014. So these two articles are separated by 10 years. And yet the subject of the article is the same person, Dr. Yoshihiro Kawaoka of the University of Wisconsin. So for bedtime stories, I'll be reading Killer Flu, recreated in the lab from the BBC. Scientists have shown that tiny changes to modern flu viruses could render them as deadly as the 1918 strain which killed millions. The U.S. team added two genes from a sample of the 1918 virus to a modern strain known to have no effect on mice. Animals exposed to this composite were dying within days of symptoms similar to those found in human victims of the 1918 pandemic. The research is published in the journal Nature. The work of the U.S. team, led by Dr. Yoshihiro Kawaoka of the University of Wisconsin, was carried out under the tightest security. Experts focused on two genes thought to play a key role in the infection process. One controls production of a spike-like molecule called hemagglutinin, HA, believed to be used by the flu virus to attach itself to the cells it is about to infect. Previous research, published earlier this year in the journal Science, identified the HA gene as being the crucial element which made the 1918 virus so deadly, and the latest work appears to confirm this. Post-mortems on mice injected in the nose with the composite virus showed that it had rampaged through their lungs, producing inflammation and hemorrhaging. The researchers stress the experiment is conclusive for lab mice and not for humans better monitoring, but they say that their work may lead to better ways to assess the potential danger of emerging flu viruses. Writing in Nature, the researchers say, once the properties of the 1918 HA gene that gave rise to its lethal infectivity are better understood, it should be possible to devise effective control measures and to improve global surveillance networks for influenza viruses that pose the greatest threat to humans as well as other animal species. Scientists believe the 1918 virus leapt to humans by mutating from bird flu, possibly after passing through pigs, which are able to harbor both human and avian viruses and thus allow them to swap genes as the viruses reproduce. For that reason, 
Experts are deeply concerned that the avian flu that has broken out in poultry flocks in parts of Southeast Asia may acquire genes that will make it highly infectious as well as lethal for humans. Professor John Oxford, an expert in virology at Queen Mary College, London, told BBC News Online the latest research underlined just what a threat all flu viruses potentially posed. He said, It's not a big difference at all between a virus that kills 15 million people and one that does not kill anyone at all. The lesson is not to be complacent about anything to do with flu. Every flu virus must be carrying baggage that could potentially harm us, and we would be well advised not to ignore them. Many deaths. The 1918 Spanish flu pandemic is estimated to have infected up to one billion people, half the world's population at the time. The disease, the virus, killed more people than any other single outbreak of disease, surpassing even the Black Death of the Middle Ages. Although it probably originated in the Far East, it was dubbed Spanish flu because the press in Spain, not being involved in World War I, were the first to report extensively on its impact. The virus caused three waves of disease. The second of these, between September and December 1918, resulting in the heaviest loss of life. It is thought that the virus may have played a role in ending World War I, as soldiers were too sick to fight, and by that stage, more men on both sides died of flu than were killed by weapons. Although most people who were infected with the virus recovered within a week following bed rest, some died within 24 hours of infection. This was Killer Flu recreated in the lab from the BBC, published Thursday, October 7, 2004. The next article that we're going to be reading is from The Independent, the title of which, exclusive, controversial U.S. scientist creates deadly new flu strain for pandemic research. And this article is written by Steve Connor and was published Wednesday, the 2nd of July in 2014. A controversial scientist who carried out provocative research on making influenza viruses more infectious has completed his most dangerous experiment to date by deliberately creating a pandemic strain of flu that can evade the human immune system. Yoshihiro Kawaoka of the University of Wisconsin-Madison has genetically manipulated the 2009 strain of pandemic flu in order for it to escape the control of the immune system's neutralizing antibodies, effectively making the human population defenseless against its reemergence. Most of the world today has developed some level of immunity to the 2009 pandemic flu virus, which means that it can now be treated as less dangerous seasonal flu. However, the Independent understands that Professor Kawaoka intentionally set out to see if it was possible to convert it to a pre-pandemic state in order to analyze the genetic changes involved. The study is not published. However, some scientists who are aware of it are horrified that Dr. Kawaoka was allowed to deliberately remove the only defense against a strain of flu virus that has already demonstrated its ability to create a deadly pandemic that killed as many as 500,000 people in the first year of its emergence. 
Professor Kawoka has so far kept details of the research out of the public domain, but admitted today that the work is complete and ready for submission to a scientific journal. The experiment was designed to monitor the changes to the 2009 H1N1 strain of virus that would enable it to escape immune protection in order to improve the design of vaccines, he said, through selection of immune escape viruses in the laboratory under appropriate containment conditions, we were able to identify the key regions that would enable the 2009 H1N1 viruses to escape immunity, Professor Kawaoka said in an email. Viruses in clinical isolates have been identified that have these same changes in the viral protein. This shows that escape viruses emerge in nature, and laboratory studies like ours have relevance to what occurs in nature. Prior to his statement to The Independent, Professor Kawaoka's only known public mention of the study was at a closed scientific meeting earlier this year. He declined to release any printed details of his talk or his lecture slides. Some members of the audience, however, were shocked and astonished at his latest and most audacious work on flu viruses, which follow on from his attempts to recreate the 1918 flu virus and an earlier project to increase the transmissibility of a highly lethal strain of bird flu. He took the 2009 pandemic flu virus and selected out strains that were not neutralized by human antibodies. He repeated this several times until he got a real humdinger of a virus, said one scientist who was present at Professor Kawaoka's talk. He left no doubt in my mind that he had achieved it. He used a flu virus that is known to infect humans and then manipulated it in such a way that it would effectively leave the global population defenseless if it ever escaped from his laboratory, he said. He's basically got a known pandemic strain that is now resistant to vaccination. Everything he did before was dangerous, but this is even matter. This is the virus. The work was carried out at Wisconsin University's $12 million Institute for Influenza Virus Research in Madison, which was built specifically to house Professor Kawaoka's laboratory, which has a Level 3 agriculture category of biosafety, one below the top safety level for the most dangerous pathogens, such as Ebola virus. However, this study was done at the lower level to biosafety. The university has said repeatedly that there is little or no risk of an accidental escape from the lab. Although a similar U.S. government lab at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, with a higher level 3 biosafety rating, was recently criticized over the accidental exposure of at least 75 lab workers to possible anthrax infection. Professor Kawaoka's work had been cleared by Wisconsin's Institutional Biosafety Committee, but some members of the committee were not informed about details of the antibody study on pandemic H1N1, which began in 2009 and have voiced concerns about the direction, oversight, and safety of his overall research on flu viruses. I have met Professor Kawaoka in committee and have heard his research presentations, and honestly, it was not reassuring, said Professor Tom Jeffries, a dissenting member of the 17-person Biosafety Committee who said he was not made aware of Kawaoka's work on pandemic H1N1 and has reservations about his other work on flu viruses. What was present in the research protocols was a very brief outline or abstract of what he was actually doing 
There were elements to it that bothered me, Professor Jeffrey said. I'm in a distinct minority on this committee in raising objections. I'm very uneasy when the work involves increasing transmissibility of what we already know to be very virulent strains, he said. Asked what he thought about the unpublished study involving the creation of a pandemic strain of flu deliberately designed to escape the control of the human immune system. Professor Jeffrey said that would be a problem. Rebecca Moritz, who is responsible for overseeing Wisconsin's work on select agents, such as influenza virus, said that Professor Kawaoka's work on 2009 H1N1 is looking at the changes to the virus that are needed for existing vaccines to become ineffective. With that being said, this work is not to create a new strain of influenza with pandemic potential, but to model the immune pressure the virus is currently facing in our bodies to escape our defenses, Ms. Moritz said. The work is designed to identify potential circulating strains to guide the process of selecting strains used for the next vaccine. The committee found the biosafety containment procedures to be appropriate for conducting this research. I have no concerns about the biosafety of these experiments, she said. Professor Kawaoka said that he has presented preliminary findings of his H1N1 study to the WHO, which were well received. We're confident our study will contribute to the field, particularly given the number of mutant viruses we generated and the sophisticated analysis applied, he said. There are risks in all research. However, there are ways to mitigate the risks. As for all the research on influenza viruses in my laboratory, this work is performed by experienced researchers under appropriate containment and with full review and prior approval by the Biosafety Committee, he added. Why is this experiment different from what has been done before? This is the first time that someone has taken a strain of influenza virus called H1N1 known to have caused a global pandemic, in other words, a pandemic, global epidemic, and deliberately mutated it many times over. It can then evade the neutralizing antibodies of the human immune system, which have protected much of the human population since the virus first emerged in 2009. What has been done previously in this laboratory? Professor Yoshihiro Kawaoka at the University of Wisconsin-Madison attempted to increase the transmissibility of the H5N1 bird flu strain by genetic manipulation and repeated infection in laboratory ferrets, an animal model of human influenza. H5N1 is highly lethal when it infects people. But in the wild, it's very difficult to transmit from one person to another and is usually caught by direct contact with infected poultry. Professor Kawaoka's most recent published research was on reconstructing the 1918 flu virus, the genetic structure, which was known from samples retrieved from the frozen corpses of its victims buried in the Arctic from wild strains of bird flu isolated from ducks. He managed to do this, but the study was widely criticized as stupid and irresponsible. Why does he want to do this work? The aim is to understand what is known as gain of function. What does it take genetically for a virus to become more infectious or more lethal? If we could understand this process, then we would be in a better position to develop drugs, vaccines, and other measures to protect ourselves from a sudden emergence of a new and deadly flu strain, or so Professor Kawaoka has argued. 
there's a big split within the scientific community over this kind of work. Some flu specialists support it, provided it is done under strictly regulated and controlled conditions. Others, mostly experts in infectious diseases outside the flu community, are passionately opposed to the work, claiming that the risks of an accidental or even deliberate release that will cause a devastating pandemic are too great to justify any practical benefits that may come out of the work. Have there been any accidental releases from labs in the past? There are many examples of other infectious agents escaping from labs. Smallpox virus escaped from Birmingham Medical School in 1978 and killed a medical photographer, Janet Parker, the last person to die of smallpox. Foot and mouth virus escaped in 2007 from a veterinary lab in Surrey. And in 2004, the SARS virus escaped from a high containment lab in Beijing, infecting nine people before it was stopped. This has been Exclusive Controversial U.S. Scientist Creates Deadly New Flu Strain for Pandemic Research by Steve Connor, writing for The Independent, in our special two-part series focusing on Dr. Yoshihiro Kawaoka at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. This has been Bedtime Stories. I'm John Cohen. Thanks for joining. I never dreamed that I met somebody like you I never dreamed that I loved somebody like you No, I don't want to fall in love Without you